Welcome to the Parkway Podcast, where we are striving to provide powerful inspiration and purposeful insights into your walk with God. I'm Stuart Carey, Outreach Pastor with Parkway Church, and I appreciate you taking the time to join me today. We are continuing our series on soul winning slash discipleship. And in the last edition, I talked quite a bit about some conversions I've seen through the years, miraculous things that God has done for people. And I wanted to keep that rolling today by answering some questions that perhaps you would have. I know they were questions that that I dealt with a lot as a younger man beginning to teach Bible studies and trying to make purposeful connections with people uh, when it comes to the gospel and people seeing their need to obey the gospel. So uh, starting out, one question that I receive a lot from people is, why do I need to receive the Holy Ghost? Many people are taught in denominal churches that when they say a sinner's prayer or when they accept Christ as their Savior, that they receive everything that they need and everything biblically that perhaps God has for them. But in reading the Word of God and certainly in believing the Word of God, we understand that there are some very definite instructions that God has given us for obeying His gospel. And we touched a little bit in the last uh, edition about repentance. Repentance always comes first in someone's experience with God, in the salvation experience. And true repentance um, is not only a turn, but it's also a complete change in attitude and lifestyle regarding the Lord Jesus Christ and his church. I've heard many people say through the years, well, I repented. I told God I was sorry for my sins or the way I was living, but many times people will return immediately into that lifestyle. That is not true biblical repentance. True biblical repentance is a complete turnaround. It is a complete overhaul of your life and your outlook when it comes to God and the things of God. And many people will ask me, Brother Kerry, uh, you mean to tell me that when I simply believed in God, I did not receive everything that God had for me? And biblically, the answer to that is no, because we know from the scriptures that even the devil, he believes in God. He knows that he's real. And I often quote the scripture from James, Thou believest in one God, thou doest well, for the devils also believe and tremble. There is no doubt in their minds as to who God is and his identity. And it is absolutely important to live a life that is pleasing to God and ultimately to make it to heaven. We have to have a true and firm understanding of the identity of God. And in order to be connected to him truly, we must have his spirit operating in our lives. I'm going to read to you from Romans chapter 8. This is the ninth verse. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. This scripture right here says that in order to operate in the spirit, we must have it dwelling in us. It says this is the way you will live if the spirit of God is dwelling within you. For if any man has not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. So clearly we're told right here that if we don't have the Holy Ghost operating in our lives, then ultimately we do not belong to him. So how do I have the Spirit of God operating in my life? How does that come to be? How does that come to pass? Well, it's very simple. It's a matter of asking God for it. You see, even though God already knows our situations, He already knows our needs, the Scriptures encourage us to pray. They encourage us to talk to God. They encourage us to take our petitions to God, if you will, and leave them with him. So if there is a need in your life or in my life, we simply have to address him and we simply ask him about it. And when you ask God to fill you with his spirit, if that has not already happened in your life, he is faithful and he is just to do that. And in the last edition, I shared about several 
um, conversions that I have seen where people thought perhaps God would not give them the Holy Ghost. Perhaps he would not fill them with his spirit. But in every case, I have seen God prove himself time and time again that as the scripture says, he is not slow nor slack concerning his promises. But when he makes you a promise, you can take it to the bank. It is going to come to pass. And when he says that his spirit is available and he would pour it out upon all flesh, that is absolutely what he means. So if you're watching this podcast today, maybe the Holy Ghost is not active in your life. And you know that. You realize that. Well, you can have it today. The scripture says today is the day of salvation. And God is faithful to fill you with his spirit if you will simply ask him in prayer. So now, he, on to the next. Many people will receive the Spirit of God, and then they are baptized in Jesus' name for the remission or the remitting, removal of their sins. But now there are some people that are baptized in Jesus' name first, and then they receive the Holy Ghost later. Now, granted, repentance is always first. It is the doorway. We must believe, according to Hebrews, that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You see, he is simply waiting on us today. So it's important that we believe that he exists. We believe that he is exactly who he says he is and he can do exactly what he says he can do. But from there, we want to make sure that we have his spirit dwelling in our lives and that we are baptized in water in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins. And there are some biblical accounts that uh, we will look at. Of course, Acts chapter 2 and verse number 38. A lot of people believe it's the only scripture that we apostolics know. You'll hear it a lot, but indeed we use the entire Bible. But it says when Peter was preaching that he told the people, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. There is a promise in that scripture that if you will repent and you will be baptized in water in Jesus' name, it says you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And I have many people that will sit with me in a Bible study and they will look at that scripture and read it with me and they'll say, Brother Kerry, is it really that easy? Is it really as simple as that? And I say, yes, believe it or not, it can be. This is for you. God has made this available to you. And then verses 39 and 40, when you go on to read, says, And the promise is unto you, it's unto your children, to all of them that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So it was not only for those people that Peter was preaching to that day, but it was for everyone from that point forward, right down to you and me. So when you're explaining to someone who's asking about the Holy Ghost, you can always take them to Acts chapter 2 as a starting point, because all denominations, um, every religion in this world that claims to be Christian by affiliation, every church, they all will agree that the New Testament church began on the day of Pentecost. Now, the interpretations can be very, very different. But it's important that when we read the Word of God, we take it literally, that we understand that these words are for us and for us even today. Now, when we move from there to uh, Acts chapter 8, we see the preaching there that takes place where Jesus' name's baptism was mentioned again, people receiving the Holy Ghost, that it was important that they be baptized in Jesus' name um, in order to receive the Holy Ghost. Uh, at that point in time, this was the teaching that was there. Uh, in Acts chapter 10, we see Peter at the home of Cornelius. Cornelius was a good man. I deal with a lot of good people on a daily basis, and you do as well. But helping people to realize their need for God is not always the easiest task. Now, Cornelius had a leg up because he was a good man, the Bible says. He was a man that prayed and loved God to the best of the knowledge that he had at that point in time. But you see, God recognized Cornelius and saw that he was a good man, but also knew that if Cornelius knew better, he would do better. So what did God do? He sent a preacher to him. 
He sent a man to him, much like he will send you and me to others to witness and to minister. He sends the apostle Peter to his home. Peter was a little bit, uh, we're told, prejudiced, if you will, because he was a Jew. Cornelius and his family were Gentiles. A Jew is simply anyone who is not a Gentile. Cornelius and his family, were told, were of the Italian band. They were basically Romans, if you will. And when Peter finally, when the Lord dealt with him on his prejudice, he went and he began to preach to Cornelius and his family and to teach them. And we're told that while he was teaching, the Holy Ghost fell on them. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. They began to speak with other tongues as evidence of that and to prophesy. And then Peter came along and said, uh, what would forbid, what would keep any of these from being baptized in water in the name of Jesus Christ? For they have received the Holy Ghost just as we, just as the Jews. So it's the first time recorded in the New Testament where we see the Holy Ghost being poured out on Gentiles. And that comes right down to where you and I are today. That is the reason that you and I are able to obey the gospel and to be saved today is because God made allowance for that. He came unto his own, we're told, which were unto the Jews, and they received him not. So that's when he turned to you and to me and said, you have opportunity to be grafted in and to experience this wonderful salvation. So that's the responsibility that rests on our shoulders when we're talking to people. I have a lot of people that will come to me and will say, Brother Kerry, I hear what you're teaching, um, but what about my relatives? What about my friends? Some of them have passed away and they had never heard this or they had no understanding of this. Well, I always tell people that when we read the Word of God, that puts responsibility on us. Titus said the grace of God has appeared unto all men. We have a heavy responsibility on us. And we can't worry about or dwell on what other people knew or what we think they knew or what we think they didn't. The responsibility for today is on you and it's on me to obey the gospel of the word of God. And it is something that all of us have to put a lot of thought into when we're dealing with other people because we have to understand that just because you've seen the light, just because you've obeyed the gospel, you have to go back and you have to remember where you were beforehand when you're dealing with people that may not have even ever been to church. They don't understand the Bible. That's the reason that God has sent you to them, to connect with them and to help them. So we always need to be able to put ourselves in the other person's place when we're teaching and ministering the Word of God. I've had people tell me or ask me, Brother Kerry, you're telling me that part of the plan of salvation is water baptism. Why do I need to be baptized in order to be saved? Well, it's very simple. We can go to the 19th chapter of the book of Acts. We can see Paul, a generation almost after the original 12 apostles, the ministry of Paul. Paul begins uh, several of his books by saying, I am Paul, I am an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. These revelations I have received, I've received directly from God. He was not teaching any different gospel than Peter or any of the other apostles. They were all reflecting what had been taught by the Lord Jesus Christ. In Acts 19, Paul comes to Ephesus. We're told that he encountered a certain group of people there. They were followers of the teachings of John the Baptist. Now, if you'll remember, John the Baptist had preached repentance. He had practiced water baptism, but what he was doing was simply bringing the people up to repentance. And these people, they were basically following an oral tradition of these teachings. And the first thing that Paul asks them when he comes in contact with them is, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? He knew they believed in God, but there was more to it. And the answer was, we've not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. In other words, what is that? Well, Paul's next question was not, what church have you joined? Or did you fill out a card or shake the minister's hand? He said, unto what or how were you baptized? And that's when they replied, unto John's baptism. 
And Paul goes on to explain that John simply baptized and was bringing people up unto repentance. But then he went on to say, there is a better way. We are living under a new covenant. There is a new form of relationship that we must have to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you need the Holy Ghost. You need the Spirit of God operating in your life. So the first thing that he commands them to do is to be baptized in the name of the Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. And they were. And when this was done, we're told that, that Paul laid his hands on them, and then they received the Holy Ghost. And the evidence of tongues was present in that situation, just as in every other New Testament conversion that we see. So my point with Acts 19 is when people ask about baptism, because I know a lot of churches teach that baptism has nothing to do with salvation, uh, that it's just an outward symbol of inward faith, and many churches have baptism Sundays, and they make a big show and a big production of it. And I'm not condemning uh, if you do them on a certain day. But biblically, baptisms were performed when people were ready. I know here at Parkway Church, we keep warm, clean, circulating water in our baptistry 24-7. We baptize people at 6 o'clock in the morning. We baptize people at 11 o'clock at night. I have literally seen and performed baptisms at all times of the night and day. When a person realizes their need, that's when it's time. But going on from there, people will say, as I mentioned, why do I need to be baptized? Or perhaps I've already been baptized another way. Why would I need to be baptized in Jesus' name? Well, we have to remember that Acts 19 teaches us a couple of things. First of all, if water baptism were not necessary for salvation, these believers in the teachings of John the Baptist had already been baptized, it said, unto John's baptism. So my question would be, why wasn't what they had already done good enough? If baptism wasn't necessary, why did Paul go to the trouble of having them rebaptized in the name of Jesus Christ? Well, Paul did that because it is part of God's three-point plan of salvation. Repentance, water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, and then we receive the infilling of the Holy Ghost. So I hope that that helps right there with the understanding when you're talking to someone, you can always take them to Acts 19, and it is a gem uh, for that information because people will often tell you, I, I don't feel like I need to be baptized or I've already been baptized another way. Why would I need to do it again? And we can always go and we can see these believers, these followers of John the Baptist were good people. They'd already been baptized in water once. But Paul said, now there's a better way. I'm asking you to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And when they did that, Paul laid his hands on them, as I mentioned earlier, and they received the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, coming to dwell within them. And friends, that is our salvation. Our salvation does not come simply from believing in God or believing that there is a God. Uh, many people will also ask me about Romans chapter 10, and I feel like this is an important um, chapter to look at and to discuss just for a moment. We must remember that Romans is an epistle. In other words, it is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Rome. And these people that he, were, that he was writing to were already born again. These were people that had already obeyed God's plan of salvation. They already understood everything that Paul was writing. So when we go to Romans chapter 10, I know that there are a number of churches and groups that teach that Romans 10 is the plan of salvation, and I, you'll hear it referred to as the Romans road at times, where simply believing on Jesus Christ or simply believing would save you. But what they fail to understand is that there's two things. First of all, as I mentioned, Romans is a letter. It is an epistle. These people were already born again. And then also we have to look at the fact that there is no one receiving salvation in Romans chapter 10. Paul's simply talking about things that are going on in the church. And I've had people ask me, well, Brother Kerry, uh, my ministry, or tell me, my minister said you can't take any doctrine from the book of Acts. 
But I say, well, what do you do with what Timothy talked about where we're told that all Scripture is inspired of God and profitable for doctrine? It's profitable for correction. It's profitable for rebuke, whatever is needed at that time in our lives. So with that being the case, we certainly cannot discount any book of the Bible. We certainly cannot discount the words that the Lord has inspired to come to us even today. So when you're dealing with people, you'll encounter these questions very often. Uh, People will tell you, well, I'm saved. Well, what I always like to say when someone tells me that or like to ask is, tell me about your experience with God. When were you saved? How were you saved? And I find that many people have trouble explaining that to me because their, their experience, while it might have been a real emotional experience to them, it was not a biblical experience. And when I hear that, the door is always open for me to begin to talk to them, not to assault them with Scripture, but to begin to talk to them and to build a relationship with them and to build a trust with them to where I can share the biblical plan of salvation with them. Now, it's no guarantee that everyone is always going to obey the gospel. But listen, you can't plant too many seeds. The Word of God says that some sow, some water, but only God gives the increase. And we have to remember that, that you and I are simply conduits. We're simply willing vessels, or we should be, that are sent forth to help people, that are sent forth to point people to a better way. I can't save anyone. You can't save anyone. But we serve a God who can, and he will, and he does on a daily basis. So I want to remember always that I'm an ambassador of his, that I'm someone who is operating with his spirit dwelling within me. So I want to be directed by him. My insights need to be purposeful. My inspiration is powerful because it comes from the God of heaven and of earth. So these are some things today that uh, some questions that you'll hear very often. Why do I need the Holy Ghost? Well, because the Word of God says you need it dwelling within, within you. Romans says, if any man hath not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. Why do I need to be baptized in Jesus' name? Because in all four of the conversion accounts that we see throughout the book of Acts, they always were. We're told that all power, Acts 4 and 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That is the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. All of the power is contained in his name. You can plug a lamp into the wall, and because it's plugged into the power source, it's going to work if the bulb is good. But you leave that lamp unplugged, it's powerless. So all of us need to understand that the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, is the power source that we have to be plugged into. So I'm talking to people today that are leaders. I'm talking to people today. If you're born again of water and the Spirit, you're called of God. You've got a responsibility on your shoulders, just as I have it on mine, to reach out to others and to help others see their need for salvation. So I pray today that that is heavy upon you as it is upon me. And I thank you for joining me today for this podcast. And I pray that some of this information has and will be a help to you. I bless you today in Jesus' name.